Hello my dears, welcome to another video. So glad to have you. Today we are going to talk about autistic coding because I have slowly watched autistic headcanons go from like, wow, if this character were made today, they would have to say that they're autistic because look at them, to this character likes to read books and once missed a social cue, so they're autistic and if you say otherwise, you're wrong. And I, I just... I'm at a point where for my autistic review series that you guys get every week, I'm watching two times as many things as I am reviewing because the majority of the things people are recommending to me are not autistic coded and it is quite the experience and it's very interesting to me. So today we're going to break down what autistic coding actually is, why I think we've gotten a little overzealous with that wording, and why doing so is actually hurting our media literacy skills. I know I briefly touched on this in my media literacy video like two months ago-ish, but I have a lot more thoughts so we're back, here we are. Also, for friends who need it, I'm a white young person with light brown shoulder length curly hair that's kind of a disaster today but we're rolling with it, um, and I'm wearing a yellow uh, v-neck vintage dress and I'm sitting in front of a plain ball that has green leaves on it. Now in order to understand autistic coding we need to understand queer coding because queer coding existed as a concept long before the existence of the first edition of the DSM. However, autistic coding as a narrative tool has probably existed longer than queer coding has, just obviously not by that name, but nomenclature is beside the point. Queer coding! In the United States from 1934 to 1968 we had film censorship rules called the Hayes Code, named after Will H. Hayes, who was the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America at the time. If you want to know more in-depth stuff about why censorship became a thing and the extent of the Hayes Code, I have a video about that linked above. Basically during this era everything that found its way into cinemas had to be approved by the Production Code Administration's Hayes Code, whose goal was to make sure that no motion picture was to be produced that might lower the moral standards of its audience. Which which means that all bad guys need to be punished and all good guys must be good 100% of the time. And also, husbands and wives must sleep in separate twin beds because we can never imply that a married couple may try to create offspring. But basically this code boils down to if you show deviant or bad behavior, the person must be punished for that behavior, with deviant and bad behavior being dictated effectively by the church. And the loophole to this is that you can show deviant behavior as long as that character is definitively a bad guy. So filmmakers started making really queer villains without explicitly saying that they were queer because that wasn't allowed, but they would imply it very heavily. Uh, Disney in particular has a lot of these, like off the top of my head there's uh, Maleficent, Captain Hook, Scar, Ursula, Jafar. There's another one I'm, I'm thinking of but I don't remember what movie he's from. He's a very effeminate like sucks his thumb fox. I think it's in Robin Hood? I could be wrong about that. Anyway, the filmmakers desire to shove in queer characters wherever they possibly could is not the only reason why narratively queer coding villains works really well because society as a whole sees deviance as uncomfortable and creepier and less trustworthy and all of these things. So these characters read as unsettling from the get-go and so even an innocent like oh we're just gonna make these villains queer because we want to have queer people in our stories does kind of also play into this and since then every narrative has played with this instinct and we get even more used to it and it becomes a self-propelling narrative tool that we still see in media today. But it also somewhat backfires by making those characters more interesting and unique and often reflecting the minority experience of being a disillusioned outcast and also being queer icons. And honestly I think this makes it more fun. Like obviously when it comes to queer representation we need queer people in all kinds of roles, but I do think that the campy queer villain genre is iconic and we've kind of replaced it with a significantly less campy disabled villain and I, I would personally like to go back Back, but that's neither here nor there. But this is the concept of queer coding, where all the pieces are there to make it clear that a character is queer without explicitly mentioning it, either because historically they couldn't or because maybe narratively it it doesn't make sense to mention that. Which is different from queer baiting, where smaller pieces are there but it's left deliberately ambiguous for the purposes of drawing in queer viewers but never actually takes the risk of showing queer characters. They can look similar, they can sometimes be the same thing, but the intentions behind it are very different. And queer coding still very much has a purpose in today's world even if the Hayes Code no longer exists because there are still many reasons that certain writers or creators may need to stay closeted for safety, where there may be a genuine narrative reason as to why fleshing that out in the story impedes the larger point of the story, particularly because right now we have this uh, societal expectation that if you're going to include disabled or queer characters it cannot be a one-off thing, it has to be somewhat explored and explained, which I have opinions on both sides of, really depends on the different factors in the media itself and also who is making the media. And autistic coding is sort of the same concept but for autism. All the breadcrumbs are there but the explicit language informing you that a character is autistic is not present. This may be for a multitude of reasons, the primary one being that 
Autism as a word has only been around for just over 100 years and has been a separate diagnosable condition for only about 80, so like, why would we expect this to pop up in older media? But also, most queer coding historically was queer people going, oh, I'm gonna make them like me! And that same level of awareness around autistic identity was not around back then, and arguably hasn't been around for more than a few decades. However, the tropes have been around for literally forever, just not named as such. Like, Plato was writing about an absent-minded professor. And if I'd cared enough during the Ancient Greece section of my history class, I would definitely be able to tell you other autistic Dakota characters in some of the original plays, um, but I, I didn't, so I don't have any. But there's a lot in Shakespeare. There's quite, quite a bit in Shakespeare. And this all makes sense. Like, we talk about a lot on this channel how storytelling relies on archetype, and archetype is an expansion of a small handful of human traits to such a degree that takes them beyond being an actual human person. But since our diagnostic criteria at its very, very simplest goes like, oh, somebody who's worried all the time is anxious, somebody who's sad all the time is depressed, somebody who switches between happy and sad all the time is bipolar, somebody who's disconnected from the social world around them is autistic, etc. When we see a character that is an archetype, it's very easy to go, oh, they have insert DSM condition because because they fit this criteria very easily. Because the criteria are written like an isolated, unemotional checklist of human traits that don't tend to actually keep in mind the complexities of human existence, but that's a whole other conversation. But because characters and stories are characters, they're going to be missing some dimension just given the constructs of runtime and wanting to actually craft a good narrative, and so it becomes easier to go, oh, they fit in this DSM category, because those often accidentally coded breadcrumbs are there simply given the nature of how humans tell stories. And there's a lot of gaps that you as the viewer or reader or whatever can then fill in yourself with your own understanding of the world and how people work, which is why just throwing out complex minority concepts into the ether and then not ever addressing them therefore leads to stereotype and becomes a further problem because people are filling in the gaps of what they already know about that, which usually isn't good stuff. And we're at a point now with gay representation where that's not majorly a concern anymore, but it is still often a concern with trans representation, ace representation, and many kinds of disability representation because they have fundamentally different histories. Now some clear traits of queer coding include flamboyance, campiness, being older and unmarried, being more androgynous in clothing and or voice, um, being kind of isolated or the odd one out, detaching from conversations that revolve around attractiveness and marriage. Um, in older movies, breaking of any gender norm or like gender role is a very common one and obviously many of these traits also carry across to explicit gay representation in modern media now. And autistic coding works similarly in that there are specific things often used to denote explicit autism in media that were also used to denote other things so we group them all together as autistic coding such as the weird mind palace stuff from Sherlock that they also use a version of in The Good Doctor. Um, the editing style that's like a slow fade between different images, usually with half of those images being a focus on like one hand stimming or like the close up on the eyeballs of the autistic character, which both points to the lagged and delayed processing of the autistic character, but also the constant overwhelm and looking at the world differently. Um, I recently made a review where I talked about how that specific editing style is seen as very early 2000s and isn't used anymore really, uh, but then a movie just came out in theaters that uses it for like most of the film. Anyway, um, there's also the autism voice which gained popularity in the early 2010s primarily in middle grade books where the characters were never explicitly stated as autistic but the clues were there. This is where they would like describe everything in hyper specific detail, they would narrate everything very matter of factly without any emotion, and then all strong emotions are shown via like repeating words over and over again or counting numbers or something like that. And I'm not gonna say that Mark Haddon explicitly created the autism voice in Curious Incident because you can much more accidentally find versions of it historically and of Green Gables as a really great example of that, um, but it did become very popular as an explicitly autistic tool after the popularity of Curious Incident because Curious went so well that everybody was like, I'm gonna capitalize on this. But this is another trope that is kind of fading into uh, branched off versions of itself, which has been very interesting to watch. Other artistic coding cues include the way a character might inhabit their body. If they walk a little atypically, if they stim, if they struggle with eye contact, characters might complain that their clothes are too scratchy or uncomfortable, they may avoid certain textures of foods, um, might get overwhelmed easily, not have many friends, um, may not understand what's happening in conversations or not engage in conversations or take things completely literally. They might Really struggle in school or be atypically good at it. Um, they're often described or framed as a sort of odd duck. Um, and it's super interesting to me how much overlap there is between cues for autistic coding and queer coding. First of all, because autistic people are much more likely to be queer than the general population, so this overlap makes complete sense. But also that we narratively cue 
We're not sure why they don't fit in, but they don't fit in regardless of what that thing is fairly similarly in a narrative sense. Which is actually part of why I think that we've gone a little bit too far with headcanoning characters, but I'll get to that in a second. As I talked about earlier, storytelling is structured in such a way that leans itself toward having a lot of neurodivergent characters, but it especially skews toward autism because one of the most common narratives, at least in Western literature starting around the rise of capitalism, is a person who feels like they don't fit in and then they go through a journey where they find their people, whether that's chosen family or their individual Mr. Darcy or like self-confidence, whatever it is, our stories center themselves around alienation. Also, sidebar, I read an article somewhere about how this kind of storytelling became popular due to the rise of capitalism many, many years ago, and I still cannot track it down, and I'm trying to source it in something that I'm writing, um, and it's driving me at the wall. So if anybody knows anybody else who's spoken about this phenomenon and can help me find some academic source for it, because I keep writing about it because I agree with it, and I've seen that trend happen over history as well in my own research, uh, but I would like to source it at some point. So if you have any leads, will be greatly appreciated. Anyway, to center your story around an alienated character, you need to make it clear to the audience that this character does not quite fit in. They're not like other girls, as it were, which is where we see autistic coding come into the picture to definitively show the audience this character is different. On the extreme side, this might be the genius scientist or detective or doctor who can't do social cues in the slightest or the manic pixie dream girl. But we also see it a lot with a traditional hero's journey when they're just the ignored, awkward underdog who gains confidence and popularity over the course of the story. Like a lot of the like, oh, this ordinary person just suddenly became a superhero stories or the vast majority of historical female protagonists because book smart women were historically seen as the other and treated as such, whether or not they actually would fall under today's diagnostic criteria, I have no idea. All of this then gets compounded when these characters find their way onto a stage because all of a sudden their I don't fit in physicality and awkwardness has to read for a massive audience, so it becomes even more larger than life than it already was, which becomes even further uh, visually understood as autistic coding. Autistic coding is also super common in denoting that a character is human adjacent, whether that is a robot or an alien or a speaking animal, and it's also really common as a comedy tool. If none of your characters can read social cues, their interactions will inherently be comedic. And also because traditional clown is either directly or indirectly based on mentally disabled court jesters and royal companions, which I've talked about before, but this is why at least half of the characters of most sitcoms can be easily explained as autistic. But this is where a crucial difference pops up between autistic coding as a narrative tool and actual autistic characters that just aren't specified as being autistic. Because you may think that these are the same thing, but they are very, very different concepts. And sometimes they overlap, and sometimes they don't. It really depends. And the more reviews that I do, the better I've gotten at talking myself out of why a character may or may not be autistic, because at this point, narrative is just so messy that I can see most everything I review in both directions. And so I began to ask myself, like, would I see this character as autistic outside of the constraints of the current story that they're in? Or are they being framed in this direction because of some other narrative reason? And so that's when I start looking at the overall narrative. I've used Ted Lasso as an example for a while, um, but like for Ted Lasso, the point of the show is toxic masculinity. I know those characters are being framed through the lens of men not being able to understand their feelings because they're conditioned to be that way, not because they might be autistic. So the coding is the same, but the narrative use of it is different. And also these characters lean toward archetypes, so I have a hard time seeing them as truly fully human people, and autism is a fundamentally human concept, so then I start to get into a whole existential crisis as to what kinds of characters are archetype versus grounded human, because really everything is rooted in archetype, but anyway, I'm trying to ignore that because if I think about it too hard, my brain will explode. The other thing about Ted Lasso is that there is an actually autistic coded character. What's her name? Oh, I'm totally blanking on it. Um, the woman in season three who becomes best friends with Keely, that's her name. I swear I've watched all of Ted Lasso twice, so the fact that I can't tell you this is very silly. Um, but she is very much, she is autistic coded. So then when you, when you look at her behavior in comparison to the rest of the team, you really see how it's a fundamentally different concept. It's very interesting. Um, I also look at the prevalence of traits. Like did they miss maybe two social cues for a comedic or plot purpose? Or do they miss literally all of them all the time? What is their physicality? How do they interact with the world? How do they behave when they're around other people versus by themselves? How do other people treat them, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, But something that I've been pondering a lot lately, specifically around media literacy is how it feels like increased identity politics and individualism and pseudo-intellectualism have kind of taken over media literacy in a way that isn't really being discussed because I feel like 
I'm seeing more and more conversations about media that focus on specific characters without acknowledging the wider world those characters are in, or their wider arc, or the narrative structure of the overall piece, which doesn't seem particularly useful, especially because if you took a lot of characters out of the world that they're in, and then you plop them into like modern day New York City, they're gonna come across as autistic because their social norms are different in the world in which they come from, which would clash with our social norms. But if everybody else in their show is in the same proverbial sandbox as they're in, either everybody's autistic in that world or nobody is. And then that brings in the question of what really is autism because it isn't an objective measure and it changes based on the culture in which a person is raised. And do we categorize autism by the internal experiences of sensory issues and all of these kinds of things or do we categorize it more primarily by how they are perceived by people around them which would then negate autism's own purpose in a society where everybody is autistic coded but then that also wouldn't make sense because autism would still exist because there's still going to be people with severe sensory issues and all of the other things that come along with autism but then autistic coding we're not necessarily looking at the person's internal state we're looking at their external state and how they're perceived so then it just gets really confusing and i don't think any of that made sense but now you understand why my brain's exploding all the time. Also, people keep saying characters with clearly other mental disabilities are autistic when not all neurodivergence is autism. In fact, simply statistically, most of it isn't autism. But overall, looking at stories through an inherently medical lens sometimes undercuts a part of why a story is there and brings in the question of at what point should we start to medicalize trauma and self-sabotage and struggling to connect with other people and all of these things that are just innate to the overall human experience. And I will fully acknowledge how this seems a bit silly and like glass houses or whatever coming from me, given that a huge portion of my job is finding hidden disability and bringing it back into the conversation, often with a specific focus on autism. But because I spend so much time trying to academically explain headcanons or gut feelings and cite my sources and make sure that I've successfully addressed every single counter argument, I'm starting to really clearly see this divide between people who are taking things that already existed and are putting them back in the context in which they should have been from the beginning, like how uh, queer theory people pull out queerness in history that's been ignored or forgotten about what was always there, versus people who are just labeling characters as certain things because they relate to the character so therefore they must be the specific identity of theirs because that's the only explanation for why they might identify with this character and i don't want to like academically gatekeep media analysis that's not what i mean to do at all and i i don't know if i phrased any of this right because at the end of the day the point of this from any direction is finding ourselves represented in history and in media so the intentions aren't all that different but one of these feels a lot more holistic and deliberate and working within an understanding of how media functions than the other one. And something I often come across in theatrical spaces is uh, people describing certain characters using mental disability terms because the character technically fits the criteria for that term. And then I have to politely go, hey, maybe don't do that. Um, and usually what I say in this scenario is something along the lines of, can you explain to me why you feel the need to use this specific term over something else? Are you using it to give a stronger shade to a character from a personal lived experience that is at least somewhat rooted in the text and in creating or recontextualizing minority identity? Or are you using it to justify a character's flaws or bad behavior and make it more palatable to yourself or make it easier to explain or relate to that character? Because if it's the first one, amazing. Let's do some research. Let's map it out. Let's make it happen. If it's the second one, we need to completely start over with how we view this character because we're no longer looking at them as a holistic human person. And I think that to some degree, this carries over to this situation as well, because it's usually not the first one, um, at least more recently, and especially with other mental disabilities where people will just headcanon a disability and then use it to defend the behavior of that character, which has always bothered me because only giving people grace when they have a diagnosable mental disability is not the revolutionary activism people think it is. Um, first of all, because it continues the stereotype that mentally disabled people create harm because of their mental disability, which insinuates that non-mentally disabled people don't create harm when literally all people create harm all the time, no matter what they try to do to not do that, because that's part of being a human person. And second of all, because it gives the same energy of like teasing somebody for wearing earplugs all the time and then apologizing when you learn that they're autistic. People can suck regardless of neurotype. And also we should not require somebody's medical history in order to be a decent human being toward them. Overall, I'm not saying that not academically based headcanons are bad. Like you're allowed to have opinions and want certain characters to be a certain neurotype or sexuality or whatever. But it might be a good idea to start to question why you might see that character that way or why you might feel inclined to view them through that lens. And also maybe think about what the author or screenwriter or whoever wanted you to actually get from that character because we need to be sure that we're looking at our media through lots of different lenses and trying to understand it in lots of different directions. That's one of the reasons in high school that you had to reread that one short story like five times and do different things to it every time. And yeah, it felt tedious and annoying and repetitive, but it did let you understand that there are tons of different interpretations and ideas to be gleaned from the same piece of text. 
And what's the point of media if not to learn about different points of view and different ways of living and being a person? Like, yes, you should want to see yourself represented and we should be asking for more representation of minority groups, but I feel like we might have taken this a little bit too far in the other direction where we're sometimes ignoring story arc and narrative meaning because we're more focused on finding one character that represents our specific identity because we're so used to having to fish for it that we're really, really fishing really hard now, which has created a situation where people are looking at media solely to find a character precisely like them and ignoring everything else about it and then justifying that by acting like it's media analysis when it's really just looking at media through the most hyper-specific, closed-minded, individualistic view possible, which is the precise opposite of what intellectual academic analysis should look like. And academia is bad, but you can do academic analysis outside of the uh, constructs of academia. You can make it accessible, you can have accessible media literate conversations that don't feel academic. Like I'm not saying like, oh you have to have a book and cite your sources. You don't have to do that at all. You just have to like understand the thing cognitively in order to talk about it. And narrative autistic coding and autistic characters can coexist. This happens a lot, but it's important that we start to notice the differences between the two and reflect on why we think it is one or the other or both. Because asking questions about why you're consuming media in a certain way is the best way to realize your own biases in looking at the world. And often Often, disabled characters do already exist in this media, you just have a very specific view of what disability is supposed to look like that is framed by your lived experience and the stereotypes you see from the universe around you, so you're looking straight through the ones that are canonically already there to try to find something else that often doesn't exist. All of which to say, Labeling characters is important. It's how we explain to people our lived experiences. It's how we understand our lived experiences. It's how we can prove that people like us have always existed. And everybody deserves to be represented in the media that we consume. But I'm also worried about this increased feeling like we need to medicalize and pathologize all aspects of the human experience in order to ascribe meaning to it or understand it or make it legitimate. Because psychiatry and psychology do not contain all the answers. Those fields are built on colonization and racism and ableism and sanism and incarceration and are not all-knowing authorities on the human experience. Experience. And in fact, the current research replication crisis is making that even clearer than it already was. The more that you learn about the history of mental disability, the more you realize that who is and is not mad is incredibly subjective and centered around harmful norms, and there is no clear delineation or distinction between the two, because human nature is really, really complicated, in case you didn't know that, um, and media strives to make sense of the human experience, and we should let the media do that without necessarily needing to medicalize it, because there's lots of other ways to explore the human experience outside of a medical context. So yes, label characters if you want to, but also take some time to ask yourself why you're labeling a specific character, why you're using that specific label, what the wider narrative is trying to say, and try to find ways to connect with other characters that aren't like you, and see the world through that lens, because those characters are also probably more like you than you think that they are. You Trust me, humans are- we're very different, but we are very similar. Because challenging your own worldview and stepping out of your comfort shows and out of your comfort zone is the best way to grow as a person and understand yourself within the wider context of personhood. Which I think is a skill that being forced online and into isolation over the pandemic drastically diminished in all of us, which has led to this increased need to find a specific thing in order to find a specific community that we feel like we fit into because we feel really, really lonely. Which has partially been a good thing because people are finally getting the help that they need and the accommodations that they well deserve, but it's also part backfired a little bit, making everybody feel even more individualized and focused on what makes them different from everybody else around them rather than what connects us all as people. But that is beyond my scope of academic knowledge, and I think that's all that I have to say on this topic right now. But it's been very interesting uh, to me to see my opinions on things grow and change the more that I work with these ideas and think further about them. I'm kind of at a point now where I could easily explain to myself why everything that I'm doing is a moot point because nothing is real and I don't want to further the flawed categorization of the DSM and the ICD because a lot of my research does work within the constraints of the colonial and carceral diagnostic criteria, but then at the same time we're still living in a society where practically these categorizations are going to be around for a while and using the basic understandings people have of those categorizations we can then get people to the next step where they understand how subjective they are and how much more complicated disability is as a wider concept. But again, then the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house and so then I find myself right back where I started, but hopefully you learned something today. Uh, hopefully this made sense and gives you something to think about. My personal cheat code is to have inside head cannons and outside head cannons, or sometimes I just think a character is autistic or queer because I want them to be, uh, but I keep those ones inside of my head. And outside head cannons are ones that I can academically back up within the wider understanding of the world in which they live in the history of media and tropes. So if that's a helpful distinction for you, there you go. And let me know if you have any further thoughts on this, if you have good examples of autistic coded but not autistic characters. My go-to examples are the main two characters from Good Omens, um, Fleabag, and most everybody from Ted Lasso. Um, <laughs> and as always, thank you for listening, thank you for learning, remember it's never too late to start over, and critical thinking is super, super sexy, and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.